let's talk about the road to the Constitutional Convention. In 1777, a year after the Declaration of Independence, Congress created the Articles of Confederation. This was called a League of Friendship among the sovereign states. The states didn't want to give up their authority, and they wanted to create a weak national government. As a result, the government that they created had very few powers. There was no ability to raise taxes. And as a result, Congress couldn't fund the national debt or pay the soldiers in the Revolutionary War. And commerce was very difficult, because the national government depended on voluntary contributions from state governments. Many of them just refused to pay their fair share. Plus, individual states were putting up trade barriers to protect their own citizens and discriminate against other state citizens. As a result, there's an economic crisis. And in addition to all that, any proposed amendment to the Articles required unanimous approval from all 13 states. And as a result, no amendment was ever ratified. All these problems were exacerbated by the state constitutions that were created starting in 1776. One really important example is the Pennsylvania Constitution. It created a unicameral legislature. That's a fancy word for a legislature with one house rather than two. There was no single president. Instead, there was an executive council. And this one house legislature started printing a lot of money in order to pay debts. And as a result, there was a lot of inflation. All this culminated in mob violence. And mob violence and the excesses of democracy are the paradigmatic cases that concentrated the minds of the founders and led them to call the Constitutional Convention. In particular, there was an outbreak of mob violence in Western Massachusetts in 1786. It was called Shays Rebellion because it was led by a farmer called Daniel Shays, who'd served in the Revolutionary War. And he, like the other vets, couldn't pay their debts because they themselves weren't getting paid by the government. And as a result, they stormed the courthouses in Western Massachusetts they wanted to seize the Springfield Armory, and they basically shut down the bankruptcy court so they wouldn't go to jail. This was so alarming to the founders that they decided to do something about it. And they resolved to create a new government strong enough to achieve common purposes, like paying debts, raising taxes, putting down rebellions. At the same time, the government had to be restrained enough not to threaten individual liberty, in particular, the rights of private property, as well as the unalienable rights of speech and conscience. So these were the main factors that led the founders to call the convention. Now, James Madison, one of the most important founders, spent the summer before the Constitutional Convention reading a trunk full of books that Thomas Jefferson had sent over from Paris. They included accounts of the failed democracies of Greece and Rome, and Madison took careful notes on these books and on the vices of the ancient confederacies, as he called them. He also read thinkers like Montesquieu, who insisted that in direct democracies like ancient Greece, with its large assembly, where 6,000 people were required for a quorum, demagogues could easily whip up populist passions. In Federalist 55, Madison said, in all very numerous assemblies, of whatever character is composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Had every Athenian citizen been Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. So Madison believed that the Athenian citizens had been swayed by crude and ambitious demagogues, politicians who'd played on their emotions. The demagogue Cleon was said to have seduced the assembly into being more hawkish toward Athens' opponents in the Peloponnesian War. Even the reformer Solon, the great lawgiver, canceled debts and debased the currency. In Madison's view, history seemed to be repeating itself in America. After the Revolutionary War, he'd observed in Massachusetts during Shays' Rebellion what he called a rage for paper money, for abolition of debts, for an equal division of property. And that populist rage had led to Shays' Rebellion, which pitted debtors against their creditors. Madison defines the central evil that a constitution is supposed to avoid as faction. And in Federalist 10, he defines a faction as any group, either a majority or a minority, animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the common good. Here is Madison's definition. By faction, he said in Federalist 10, I understand a number of citizens 
whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Now, according to classical theory, republics could only exist in a relatively small territory where citizens knew each other personally and they could assemble face to face. Plato wanted to cap the number of citizens capable of self-government at 5,040. Madison, though, thought Plato's small republic thesis was wrong. He believed that the ease of communication in small republics was precisely what had allowed hastily formed majorities to oppress minorities. Extend the sphere of a territory, Madison wrote in Federalist 10, and you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens, or if such a common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength and to act in unison with each other. Madison predicted that America's vast geography and large population would prevent passionate mobs from mobilizing, and dangerous energy would burn out before it could inflame others. In other words, in a big country with slow communications technology, it'll just be hard for factions or mobs to discover each other, and by the time they do, they'll get tired and go home. You can't just send off a tweet or an email when you have to send letters and read newspapers and news traveled slowly over the large republic. So given the difficulty of coordinating mob actions, Madison was confident that passions would cool and reasons would prevail. So for all these reasons, Madison came to Philadelphia with his fellow delegates, resolved to create a constitution that would avoid the dangers of faction and would protect individual rights. And that is what brought them to Philadelphia in 1787.